Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, wonderful. I'm not used to that. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to welcome you to the Agriculture Museum. My name is Marisa Solorsono Hamilton. I'm the programs director. And I just wanted to say that when Blanchard Library and the Ventura County Poetry Project approached us to be the third partner in bringing this program to the community, we were thrilled and honored. Our museum is a space not just for reflecting on the past, but for living the present and dreaming about the future. And we are just so thrilled to welcome the newly appointed California Poet Laureate, Lee Herrick, and other Ventura County poets to this space. In order to um, introduce them, I will go ahead and turn the mic over to, um, I'm so sorry, to Phil Taggart from the Ventura County Poetry Project. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to, that, to be able to present uh, Luzma Espinosa and um, Lee Herrick. Lee Herrick is a wonderful poet. You guys are in for a real treat. I've got a bunch of stuff written about Luzma, but I'm going to tell you how I really got to know Luzma and got to, re uh, uh, got to appreciate what she had done for the community. Uh, several years ago, uh, you guys know who Gabino Aguirre is, right? You should. He was the mayor of, of, uh, um, of Santa Paula for, several, for a couple of years. He did this thing where he helped close down Main Street and open it up to De Calores and Javier Montez. And so there was this great, great program going of Latino culture closed off in a closed off area downtown, honored the culture, honored what was here. And as I was looking through the art, because I thought, oh, it's a little small town, they won't have any art. And, uh, <laughs> And then I walked and I was looking at it and I said, the Royal Chicano Air Force? That's here? <laughs> and as you know, the Royal Chicano Air Force is really one of the big uh, Chicano movement artists, you know, be around the, uh, um, around the uh, farm workers and around the, that whole movement. That was, that was them. And uh, you hear about them, they've come on, you know, they, they've kind of grown into things like Teatro Lin La Quech, and uh, uh, of course, De Calores, and, and then there was Luzma. And Luzma is a, just a wonderful gym. She went to Santa Paula High School. She, you know, she went to, she, uh, see, uh, now this is where I'm having, this is where I just start having problems with it. Uh, she's been an activist for a very long, for social change. She's been her, uh, inspired by Jose Montoya, Javier Vacheco, John Trudell, and became a member of the Royal Air Force in Sacramento in, in an art collective. She also taught and performed with Danza Teca in, on the Central Post and in theater productions. And in Mexico City, she actually went to, uh, as a student, and went to Mexico City. And she is bringing back her art and her poetry, telling the truth, poetry. Poetry that is sacred in many ways. And so we're going to start off with a really incredible poet, Luz Marie Espinosa. Good morning, everybody. It's a nice sun uh, Sunday morning, right? And Phil has to get me a stool, because um, I'm short. <laughs> um, I have old eyes. I can't see real well. Am I right? Uh, is there? I, I, need, I need light. It's a trip. They say. You know, they say that old age is not for sissies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I have found that to be true. <laughs> and um, I wrote this poem when I lived in the Bay Area. You know, little old Santa Paula girl was out 
to Mexico City, then came back and then decided San Paulo was too small and everybody knew everybody's business. So I wanted to go and go up to San Francisco with the San Francisco Mime Troupe and other people and do theater over there and do whatever I wanted to. And um, from there, I decided that San Francisco was too busy for me. <laughs> I wasn't as big of a city person as I thought. And so I went to Sacramento and I joined the Royal Chicano Air Force. And um, what happened there was I blossomed. I blossomed and I realized all these, all these insecurities, all these things that I had inside had to be because I was an artist. No wonder artists are we're really insecure even though we don't admit it. So this, I wrote this poem then because when I went to Sacramento and I went to Folsom, I used to go to the trading post there to buy beads and stuff to do art, to do crafts. And I would see these mountains. And what I got from the locals was that when the gold rush happened, people just moved mountains looking for gold. But the thing is that they never put it back. At the same time, during that time, we were having meat being buried because there was too much meat and too much milk consumption going on and the prices they wanted them to keep, keep up. So this is a poem I wrote about that. It's called, What Kind of Peaceful Country? A young man watching a film on Hiroshima, saddened, turns to his abuelito and asks, Grandfather, what kind of peaceful country is our nation when we can horrendously initiate violent attacks on the land which is our Earth Mother? What kind of peaceful country can place barbed wire borders on the land, proclaim ownership of the water and the air, and imprison or attack anyone who dares tread. Tell me, grandfather, can we truly call ourselves peaceful? What kind of peaceful nation can we really be when we can alter the course of the rivers, the oceans, and the climate, when we can move mountains from one place to another in the name of progress or to make a dollar? Grandfather, tell me, tell me, Tell me, Grandfather, what kind of peaceful country can our notion truly be when we can have biological warfare, drop bombs on innocent children, and bury meat for a dollar while the rest of the world is starving? Tell me, Grandfather, what kind of peaceful nation when can we really call ourselves? The Grandfather, surprised and startled, by the child's questions, piensa y piensa y piensa. Finally, he answers, mijo, we're not peaceful, I'm ashamed to say. Y todo esto, I too don't understand. But Mr. President says, all this is necessary. He says we are fighting for democracy and peace. And young man and grandfather, Neither said a word, and yet both understood. I'm going to read this one in both English and Spanish. I have it in both languages. And so Phil said I could do it in both. And um, so much of our life, we were always hoping and dreaming of what to do, for who we want to be. And as you get older, you realize, what? I can't live now, right? I don't have much time. Who knows when I'm going to, when I'm going to go. So this is called Live in the Moment. I'm going to do it in English, and then I'll do it in Spanish. Live in the Moment. There's no great secret, no great feat to live in the moment, yet so difficult to reach. There are those eternally yearning to be happy, to be free, yet are unwilling to do the work for who or what they want to be, 
focusing on what they are not, what they don't have, blind to see that to live in the moment, not in the past, not in the future, surrendering to the present, puts at our feet exactly what we need. One must reflect with gratitude what we have lived, the good and the ugly, the laughter and the tears, along with the enchantments, for they give us the strength and courage to continue our life's journey towards the light far beyond the sun, to arrive at old age, continue to see life with the heart and eyes of a child is to live in the moment. In Spanish, vivir el momento. Vivir el momento no es un gran secreto, pero difícil de lograr. Habemos quienes siempre lo anhelamos, queremos lo ajeno, pero no trabajamos. Siempre nos enfocamos en lo que no somos, lo que no tenemos, lo que no logramos, sin darnos cuenta que vivir el presente, no el pasado ni el futuro, nos da precisamente lo merecido. Hay que agradecer lo que hemos vivido, lo bueno y lo malo, las risas y los llantos y los encantos, pues nos dan la fuerza para seguir el camino hacia la luz más allá del sol, llegar a ser viejo o vieja con el corazón de criatura, como Marcelino Pan y Vino, eso es el vivir, vivir el momento. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing you. For once, I don't need a stool. Um, thank you very much, Luzma. Thank you for a wonderful reading. I think in times of uh, um, troubles, in times of, of, uh, of strife and all the stuff that we're, we're um, oh, I forgot to ask people to get to silence their cell phones. Okay. That's okay, that stuff happens. Um, I think the artists usually stand up to make sure that that is possible. You know, at least we have a voice. We don't always have a voice on TV, and uh, the artist takes place that does that. And Luzma is an example of what that is like. Okay, now, Lee Herrick is the California Poet Laureate. He is the author of three books of poems, Scar and Flower, Gardening Secrets of the Dead, and this many miles from desire. And I think the books are for sale back there. Uh, he is co-editor with Lee Silvius of The World I Leave You, Asian American Poets on Faith and Spirit. He has served as City Poet Laureate in Fresno. And these right here are all the stuff he's been published in, but I'm not gonna read that. <laughs> Uh, he's, you know, he's in, in the advisory, he, he serves as the advisory board of Terrain Organization of 16 Rivers Press. He is taught in China and for the Kundiman. He's co-founded Lit Hop in Fresno. He has traveled throughout Latin America and Asia and has given readings across the United States. He was born in South Korea and adopted at 10 months of age and was raised in California. So there's more stuff. But what I'm gonna do, this is, to me, is always this important stuff. When I find poets that I know talking about another person's work. And so this is what Patricia Smith says about Lee's work. These gorgeously rendered snapshots, a disarming fusion of lyric and meticulous narrative are clearly the work of a true storyteller, a master of folk, focus and fearlessness, 
There is a whole life lurking within these stanza, a life that Herrick has masterfully unreal in his role as witness, during which he manages to be both the other and all of us. If there was even a modicum of doubt about this poet's enviable talent or his place among those who've crafted a singular creative signature, Gardening Secrets of the Dead will lay that indecision to rest. And this is, uh, um, this is praise for his first book by uh, uh, a person that has, has been a friend of Ventura County Poetry for a long time, Amy Uyamatsu. Lee Herrick's debut collection, This Many Miles from Desire, makes you stop and think about everything you've assumed before. As a Korean adoptee, Herrick stretches, deepens, and illuminates our previous notions of mother, both maternal and national identity, father, god, lover, the poems which emanate from the poet's, the poet's Fresno home to the journey, journeys to Seoul, China, Southeast Asia, Latin America, radiate a lovely sensuality grounded in an earthy, humbling wisdom. In this book, The Closing Lines, Herrick talks about the sacred as in, in the moment when she, in here, when she touched your bare arm for the first time, her fingers like cool flashes of heaven. <coughs> Amy Matsu. Now you're into a wonderful treat, Lee Herrick. Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be here for so many reasons, some of which I want to just briefly speak to before I read. Uh, first, thank you, Phil, for your friendship and poetry and friendship in general, for the wonderful visit to your class on Friday and the dinner with Marsha um, last night in Ventura, and for bringing me here. Uh, thanks to the Ventura County Poetry Project and to the library and especially everyone here at the Agriculture Museum. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, Luz Maria, what beautiful poems. Thank you for reading. That was a treat um, and an honor. And, and just as an aside, I, I am good friends. I was good friends with Jose Montoya's uh, late nephew, Andres. Montoya, who was the first poet I met when I moved to Fresno in 1997. So it's a real treat to hear your poems. Uh, my wife, Lisa, is here. Um, sometimes when I get up at a reading, I just want to talk about my gratitude for Lisa for my time. Um, I won't, but that's Lisa over there. Thank you for <laughs> being here. And also, yeah. And I'm so happy, you know, I grew up in uh, the Bay Area after being born in South Korea. So the East Bay and then Modesto. And I've lived in Fresno now for about 26 years. But for the last 51, since I was, have been in the United States, I've been coming down to this part of the state every year once or twice. I've got a lot of family and friends in Ventura County. Uh, some of them are here. Um, I won't name them nor point them out, but I'm so glad you're here. I see some of you, and thank you from Ojai and uh, Hi, Leslie. Uh, Ventura and San Inez. So, and thank you all for being here. Um, since the appointment, it's been a, a whirlwind of wonderful blessings, I feel. Um, the governor and the first partner walked into my classroom at Fresno City College and surprised me. And um, Lisa and I went to the inauguration and now really the, the readings and events begin in earnest. So I'm very grateful to be here. And I think there is time afterwards, unless you all are making your way to the next thing, I think there's time for questions, Phil, if that's 
Yeah. So the first poem I'm going to read is titled, My California. Here, an olive votive keeps the sunset lit. The Korean 20-somethings talk about hyphens, graduate school, and good pot. A group of four at a window table in Carpinteria discuss the quality of wines in Napa Valley versus Lodi. Here, in my California, the streets remember the Chicano poet whose songs still bank off Fresno's beer-soaked gutters and almond trees and partial blossom. Here, in my California, we fish out long noodles from the pho with such accuracy you'd know we'd done this before. In Fresno, the bullets tire of themselves and begin to pray five times a day. In Fresno, we hope for less of the police state and more of a state of grace. In my California, you can watch the sun go down like in your California, on the ledge of the pregnant 22nd century, the one with a bounty of peaches and grapes, red onions and the good salsa, wine and japche. Here in my California, paperbacks are free. Farmers markets are 24 hours a day and always packed. The trees and water have no nails in them. The priests eat well. The homeless eat well. Here in my California, everywhere is Chinatown. Everywhere is K-Town. Everywhere is Armenia Town. Everywhere, a little Italy. Less confederacy. No internment in the valley. Better history texts for the juniors. In my California, free sounds and free touch. Free questions, free answers, free songs from parents and poets, those hopeful bodies of light. Thank you. Thank you. So some of my family down here are citrus farmers. And if you know Fresno, of course, it's a, a city and region of great agriculture, too. And I was driving by this farmer's market that we go to regularly, and it had this great sign that said, Strawberry for Sale. And I loved that because as a grammarian and a word geek, but also a human that's interested in migration and farming and other languages and the beauty of that. Um, I just love the language. Sometimes we're quick to critique difference given our language skills, but I thought how amazing this family's um, farming. So this poem is called Strawberries. <clears throat> Strawberries. <clears throat> Sorry. I thought I had this marked. <clears throat> um, strawberries. I pulled into the dirt lot for delicious strawberry because I stopped for entrepreneurs and grammar like that. What is more American? I too came from another country, like someone once did in your family, who had what it took to farm in a new language, learn the laws, learn the people. When I was a boy, before I became a citizen, I pledged allegiance to the flag before I knew what allegiance was, what an ally was, what a republic was, or what it meant to stand. I entered the dream of the farmer when I walked up to his business. Each basket of berries, another dollar for his son, who has not been to Southeast Asia but knows California well, 
knows the supermarkets and the malls, the ocean swells, and the angle of sunlight in his mother's fatigue. The farmer speaks like a poet, dreaming about the river back home. I bet his favorite American poet would be Rich or Whitman, Espada or Vang. I buy six baskets and no sky opens, no doves break into flight, but the first perfect strawberry glistens in the valley light before I take it into my mouth and become a citizen of these open American fields. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read mostly from Scar and Flower, and then I think I'll read a couple of new poems. Um, this, this book, Scar and Flower, I wrote over about a four or five year span, uh, 2014, 2016, 17, 18. And, and in 2016, there were a lot of things happening that were just haunting for me, and I think for many people in this country, and at the risk of getting slightly heavy for a moment, I don't know if this is heavy or not, but it talked a lot about trauma, gun violence, um, and I want to read one of these poems. Um, this, this poem, I was thinking of people like Eric Garner and Michael Brown and Tamir Rice, all of whom were killed in 2016. <clears throat> what I hear when I hear you in my head. It's the little whisper, the aggregate sorrow, the father's heavy weeping as the son's heavy weeping. What I hear is your artistic response after the massacre, the family of clasped hands, black hands, brown hands, a small child whose brother never had a chance who holds her father's tearful face and says, your eyes are like the moon, is what I hear when I hear you in my head, your laughter like tiny harps. I hear your fatigue as another way to say deprivation. I hear recount, retally. A retaliation is what I hear when I hear you in my head. It's the grace, the charm, the dead, the boy, the dead boy, the girl, the boy who died because of the fear, the forest in the other man's heart, the gun, the heartbreak. It's the sound I hear when I hear you in my head. It's how we each sigh with distinction, where fatigue meets fire, where we wake and wonder if we all go out to a field tonight sit by a fire, say the most honest thing you've ever said in your life. Would any dead boy or girl reappear? Not like a mirage, but reappear. Not like a voice in my head, but a body in this room with flesh and bones, with his big smile and orange blossoms in his billowing hair. So that's... A poem, that, thank you. Thank you. I think I'll continue along this tone. So I was adopted and um, was born in Daejeon, which is a city a couple hours south of Seoul, um, sometime in late 1970. I don't know my exact birth date, but my paperwork says December 16th. Uh, I don't know or have never met birth family, close birth family. I've met some distant cousins, fourth and fifth cousins through DNA, but I haven't met birth parents or first parents, we call them, or any siblings. But, um, you know, one's circumstances early on are going to influence his or her or their art, right? And so poems like this, I was going to say they arise, but they're always kind of with us, our upbringing, our youth, the people and memories and experiences we know and remember and those that we don't. And so this poem is sort of about that. 
It's called How Music Stays in the Body. And it's sort of written for my birth mother in mind. Your body is a song called Birth or First Mother, a miracle that gave birth to another exquisite song. One song raises three boys with a white husband. One song fought an American war overseas. One song leapt from 14 stories high and like a dead bird shattered into the clouds. Most forgot the lyrics to their own bodies or decided to paint abstracts of mountains or moons in the shape of your face. I've been told mothers don't forget the body. I can't remember your face, the shape, or story, or how you held me the day I was born, so I wrote 1,000 poems to survive. I want to sing with you in an open field, a simple room, or a quiet bar. I want to hear your opinions about angels. Truth is, angels drink too. Soju spilled on the halo, white wings sticky with gin, as if any mother could forget the music that left her. You should hear how loudly I sing now. I've become a ballad of wild dreams and coping mechanisms. I can breathe now through any fire. I imagine I got this from him or you, my earthly inheritance, your arms, your sigh, your heavy song. I know all the lyrics. I know all the blood. I know why angels howl into the moonlight. Okay. Thank you. Gosh. Thank you. Feeling dehydrated. I feel like I need to drink more water. Excuse me. Mm. The water, and I love Fresno. I want that on the record. I say it everywhere I go. But one of the things I especially enjoy being outside of Fresno is your clean air. <laughs> it's such clean air. I don't know if you all, you know, don't notice it. You know that story of the philosopher who was walking by, and he asked the fish, "Hey, how's the water?" And one of the fish said, what's water? <laughs> Y'all have great air down here. <laughs> I know you know that, but uh, um, <clears throat> let's see. So I'll read a few more, three or four more. Mm. So I imagine many, if not all of you, or some of you have flown. I know that. And I was flying once to Oregon and I was doing a crossword puzzle. My, my mom is a big crossword puzzle person and Scrabble. Um, my grandma, uh, Nana or Hattie, um, who lived in Ojai till she was 96 and all of her life, almost, well, most of her life, um, they would do Scrabble uh, games, these battles and crossword puzzles. And I was on a flight once and I started to do the crossword puzzle, but somebody had started the crossword puzzle and then another person had started it. And um, I tried to do some of it, and, and this poem took off from there. I don't know what happened, but it turned into this poem called Flight. Um, <clears throat> I think it's something about the people we meet and wonder. Flight. The in-flight magazine crossword partially done a corner begun here, scratched out answers there. One set of answers in pencil, another in the green. The woman with the green ballpoint knew the all-time hit king is Rose, and the Siem Reap treasure is Angkor Wat. And the woman, perhaps en route to hold her dying mother's hand in Seattle, forgot about death for 10 minutes while remembering her husband's Cincinnati Reds hat while gardening after the diagnosis. Her handwriting was so clean. Maybe she was a surgeon. 
maybe a painter. No, what painter wouldn't know 17 down? <laughs> Diego's love, five letters. In a rush, her dying mother's voice came back to her, or maybe she was a Chinese adoptee, and her first mother's imagined voice said, Wo ai ni. At 30,000 feet, you focus on 33 across, Asian American classic, the woman. When a stranger in the window seat sees the clue and watches me write in W, and she says, warrior. And for a moment, you forget it is your favorite memoir, and she reminds you of lilies or roses, Van Gogh or stems with thorns, art galleries in romantic cities where she is headed, but you should not go. The flight attendant grazes my shoulder, the crossword squares, the letters, the chairs and aisles seem so tight in flight, but there is nothing here but room, really. Maybe the next passenger will know what I do not. 64 down, five letters, purpose. And why do we remember what we do? We know the buzz of Dickinson's fly and the number of years in Marquez's solitude but some things we will never know, as it should be. Why the body sometimes rumbles like a plane hurtling over Southern Oregon. How exactly we fall in love, or if Frida and Maxine Hong Kingston would have loved the same kind of tea. Thank you. Short poem, Breath. In four parts, one, by the time I discovered my body, it was perfectly human. All this sin, the chambers and aorta of the large muscle, I was a series of numbers on a chart the start of the mouth. Two, if you gather the data from the robots of your city, the wires all shine in certain light and the kids inhale a canopy of polluted air and heave a last prayer. Three, we call the body, heart calls the body, the body calls the hurt natural. We call nature a tree on fire from only heat, its only burn. Four, we call this idea agriculture, poetry culture, or office culture. The sum, the atoms, what you take in before you let breath out. And thank you. I'll just read a couple more. Uh, three more. Um, so these are two new ones, and then I'll read one last one from um, Scar and Flower. So this is a food poem. It's just a, these, this is a fun poem to read for me. Um, I know you all know it down here, but the food is amazing, and Fresno's got amazing food, and we love food trucks, and um, farmer's market food, and the, the juice from friends' ranches, and all of that amazing stuff. Um, so I was asked to write a poem about food trucks early on in the pandemic, and thank gosh, goodness, God, we're hopefully, you know, moving into a new light, but this is the poem, it's called a B. Sedarian love song for street food, and for any poetry geeks like me, if for what it matters, uh, if you don't know, the A B. Sedarian is a form where every line of the poem begins with the next letter of the alphabet. Um, so this poem is called A B. Sedarian love song for street food, and it has an epigraph.
from the late, great Anthony Bourdain, who said, street food, I believe, is the salvation of the human race. <laughs> All praise for the pozole glistening in midday light by the grace of the woman near the comal. In Southern California, Raul Martinez unveiled a mobile downtown gold mine of Al Pastor by a bar in East LA for the drunks, the artists, the necessary future waiting in line. Praise be to the ice cream truck, glory of the van's slow roll. So praise the van, hut, cart, booth, tent, stall, stand, bike, or truck. I once devoured a Tlaiuda in Oaxaca City, broke down just as the sunlight burst through the heart of a woman kissing her baby's forehead by the plaza. When I say love, what I mean to say is, I dream of you through disaster, malady, or even this nightmare, anxiety, pandemic, even in this late dying. Let us praise the 20,000 open-hearted vendors in Bangkok and the glorious pupusas in San Salvador I ate on a bench near a dove. Quesadilla, arepa, tukpoki, Hallelujah. The bon mi right on the outskirts of Hue. The chili pepper, the cilantro songs. Praise the Zocalo saints who brought me to tears with a taco so full of music I almost wept. <laughs> Under the Beijing moonlight, balsa is made by angels, vendors with wings if you know where to look. On West 53rd and 6th Avenue, New York City, halal, or in Fresno, no xenophobe is welcome. Tell me what to eat. Your chuan, your elote, your mouthful of pure zen, like savory, surprising flashes of heaven. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, one more brand new one. I've only read this one once, actually just Thursday night. So it's a poem about sound and what we miss, you know, sounds. You remember sounds that you haven't heard for so long or that you miss? Um, okay. Partial crown in praise of absent sounds. I want the fax machine, the dot matrix buzzsaw of news across the wire, the young woman's lisp and fire during solo moonlight road trips, the shuffle of predictable card tricks, the acoustic chord like sweet desire, the rotary dial and pronunciation error. When I say absent sounds, I mean typewriter key as much as anio or ye, the eight track plunk as much as Korean vowels drawn out at the end like a plain blue sky. I want to know the way home. There's not much more I need. Home. There's not much more I need except to know how much blue sky there is from here to you. Why I sometimes hear your voice freed, wild, true. Please take the lead. At times I thought I was going to die. At times fire. At times firefly. My daughter was four at the art galaxy, excuse me. My daughter was four at the art gallery and called it the art galaxy. <laughs> A malapropism I wish existed. Star, sonnet, and serenade. I want the mispronunciation, broken rhythm and scratched record. Survivor wisdom. A mother's prayer for her son who stayed perfectly still when she left and kissed him. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll just read one more. This is a poem called Repertoire. And again, I, I mean it very much. Phil, thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you, you, you do and who you are. And thank you all for being here. Appreciate it very much. Uh, this is a poem about just keeping going, perseverance, repertoire. The nastiest lick in the whole damn repertoire is in the first movement, the conductor said to the first violin. A concerto like tonight's is a dream swell, a dark circus of fluted magic, the nasty hell of your own difficult year, the bright chorus of your own survival, a wash in a floral weave of ocean foam among the dreaming musicians preparing for the nasty lick, their lips tightened like fists, Rusted knives in a deep inventory, one blade for large game, one blade for short trees, one blade for berries, one blade for gutting the whole damn idea. We have what the conductor would call a repertoire. How to maneuver if you aren't in tune, how to bail when the wave overtakes you, when the concerto has such mean licks you almost break. The lights dizzy the fighter in you, but your repertoire comes back in some animal moment, your breath now in time with your instrument, and everything aligns as it should. Your glistening body healed from the incision, your flawed key buried under your shining knives, your favorite chapter your go-to song. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.